Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, that twice weekly podcast for people who make the fine art with the needle and thread and ground cloth. And this time, this week, we're doing Needlepoint with Margaret Bendig of Margaret Bendig Designs. Hi, Margaret. Hello. How are you? Doing okay. Now, Margaret, Good. you you did a, a class uh, just before Christmas with the Fox chapter, so got to meet you and have dinner, so that was fun. Yes, and, it was. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for inviting me, by the way. Yeah, well, yeah, it was. Uh, everybody enjoyed it. Everybody Good. enjoyed it. So I yeah, hope so it's a great chapter and a great group of people. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really is. Is yep, exactly. Yeah, there was. Um, uh, uh, we're buying uh, ornaments, buying your ornament charts, and uh, yes, uh, what a nice surprise! Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, that order's coming at the end of the month. Yep. Oh wow. Well, good. I'll be ready. I think it's going to be healthy. I, I have a sense. <laughs> oh, it was so nice of Mary to even suggest it. Yeah. It was very yeah. nice. Yeah. Well, uh, some great, it's... yeah, some great ornaments. Uh, yeah, people should check it out. And um, uh, actually, um, angfox.org is the website for our chapter, and there's a slideshow there of just about all of uh, Margaret's uh, ornaments, Christmas ornaments. So. Um, you want to see them, they're there. Oh, thank yep. you. Yep. And there's an order form. I'm pretty sure that if you ordered, <laughs> if, you, if you ordered through it, uh, our, uh, our Mary McGuire would be happy to, um, <laughs> ship them to you. So, yep. She's quite the lady. She is terrific. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're one of those rare ones. Usually when we have a guest, I spend considerable time searching high and low to learn about the guest so that I'll know what to talk about. Mm -hmm. There ain't nothing about you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm a stealth teacher. <laughs> yeah, there's teacher nothing. Teacher designer. So there's we're not much out there. No, there isn't. There's nothing. So we get okay. to start from scratch, right okay, from scratch. Let's go. Yeah. So the first, you know, I mean, the first and obvious question is is how does stitching come into your life? What uh, was it, uh, mother, grandmother, or just on your own? Uh, a a little of mother and on my own. Uh, when I was a little kid, maybe five or six years old, and there were, my mother had three little girls at that time, and I was the oldest, and I'm sure I was driving her nuts. And she took me down to, like, Woolworths and bought floss and stamped linens, like table, not tablecloths, but, like, um, dish towels and pillowcases. And uh -huh. said, and taught me how to do just plain embroidery. I was so excited. I, you know, I showed up the next week in her room on Saturday morning and said, are we going back to the store? And she's like, that was four dish cloth, four uh, dish towels, and two pillow cases. Are you sure you're through? You know, it was that exciting to me just <laughs> to see it grow. So it kind of went from there. But up until, you know, I, you know, as the years went on, you get busy with school and you get busy in college. And in college, I picked up needlepoint, which I had not done before, and I was self-taught in needlepoint, and and it all grew from there. I liked everything charted. So I like, I painted canvas is wonderful because you don't have to make a lot of decisions, just the fun part, the colors and the stitches. Yeah. But I do enjoy charted design. So I do charted, um, can canvas. Yeah. Uh, so, so let's go back to the college. Cause that's, that's when I learned, that's when I first encountered stitching of any kind. Right. And, uh, it was needlepoint cause I had a girlfriend and, and her friend both did needlepoint and yes. I, you know, I, you wouldn't think as a, a male in college, I'd give a rip, but it, it just looked like fun. And yes. so, so I got dragged into it. So how, how is it that in college you get latched onto needlepoint? You know, it's interesting. I, I think it was a stress buster um, for me. <laughs> you know, yep. I, I, I was, uh, it was my freshman year in college and I was in, um, I uh, was in a pretty rigorous course and, and, I just needed something to kind of take my mind off of, of chemistry and biology. I kind of stepped away from. Oh, that's what something... you did too. All right. <laughs> I, did, I, you know, I did a little of everything, but I did that too. And I had to kind of move away from it and have something that would, I could just, you know, mindlessly do. And a friend of mine was getting married and her um, mother had a little needlepoint shop down in Texas in some little town and she showed up one day and she said, I need the background stitched on this piece. And it was a stool cover 
uh, and it was a, uh, she had stitched the center. She'd done all the fun. And so, <laughs> yeah, but she, yeah, she did the fun part and she said, I just need this done. And so I sat down with the book and I looked at how you do basket weave. And I, I that was, that's how I got into it. It's like, I can do this. This has helped somebody and it takes a, and it just took me away. And, uh, that's where needlepoint started for me yeah. was in college. Huh. Yeah. 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 I, I remember those uh, with wool needlepoint with wool and you do, yes. the, you do the design that, Oh no, I got to slog through the background now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I broke a few rules even then. I didn't know uh, that I didn't, we didn't work on frames then we worked in hand Yes. and, uh, and here I am and I've got this little uh, chair seat and I'm a little compulsive about things. So I'm pulling, you know, I'm, I'm making sure the tension is right, and I'm going on along. And I practiced on the outside first, and I thought, this is kind of boring. And so I just started doing it in diagonal mosaic, and I, I didn't know it was diagonal mosaic. Oh. I just, just did it. You know, there's no original ideas, you know. Right. That, that something's always somewhere else. And I'd probably seen it in another piece or whatever, so I did the whole thing in diagonal mosaic. And her mother was very unhappy with me because it had to be <laughs> blocked multiple times. <laughs> so, but she didn't have to stitch it. So yeah, so quit complaining. Yeah, we learned, don't we? <laughs> so that's what I did. Yep. Oh, so, so that's that's where the designer pe peeks its head out is, uh, yes. I, I see this, but yes. I'll, I have my own way. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a little boring. I think I'll do something else. Yeah. So. So did you, it was fun. so then after that, then it was, uh, give me some more of that. Yeah. You know, um, life kind of gets in the way, you know, how it is, you, yep. you grow up and you, you just, you have a real job and you have things to do and you have a family. And I, I, um, I'm kind of just doodled at that time. Um, the needlepoint was available in the, in the local, um, uh, stores like Foley's in Houston had, carried, had a little needlepoint section and I would go in there and get painted canvases and stitch them up and then enjoyed it all. You know, I could work on them at lunch at work or um, in the evenings and uh, a long commute if I was the passenger. So I, I kept in it, but when uh, my husband and I uh, moved to California, I did not go back to work. I, uh, we had two kids and I thought I, I've got to do something else. And so I think I was pregnant with my second child when I found out about the Embroiderers Guild and A&G and I went and joined them both right away and jumped in with both feet. Now, cause I'd been doing things on my own. I bought Joe with the Christensen's book. You know, I have the, uh -huh. you know, the original copy. I love <laughs> it to death. And that was, that's a treasure. That, that's a treasure it, by itself. Yeah, it is. It is. And it triggered, you know, so much. And, um, it, it's right there. It was all right there. It was just waiting to be discovered. And, and then when we started stitching with things other than wool, it really took off. Yeah. yeah it was much more interesting. Now see that, that I missed that transition because I had, uh, moved over to cross stitch uh, mm. be, be, mainly because I, I got I reached a point uh, you know after I got married I mean and, and you, yeah yeah exactly you start to have kids and, and time is yeah. very limited yes. but, but also it was the the wool you know the, the big big hole canvas and wool and it just it got not appealing and basket weave and then the background I had so many pieces where the background needed to be done that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I just kind of lost interest. But then about that time, cross stitch was you know, store every, every other block, you know? Sure. And, uh, so then I kind of got latched into that. And, uh, and, and so when I started paying attention to needlepoint again, the, um, all the threads had emerged and uh. or not all of them, but you know, a good number. And then, and mm. then it was, Oh, this is a whole different ball game here now. It was phantasmagorical, yeah. <laughs> uh, really. It was because all of those sparkly, wonderful threads. And I came to metallics late. I I really loved silk work. I liked the you know laying silk and the sheen of it and the colors and and um, and I I was dragged kicking and screaming in, into <laughs> adding uh, metallic to it by my students. And I have to say, I, I love it as much as they do. I really do. It just, yeah. it changes the piece so much. There's so much more life to it. Oh yeah. And so. you don't need a lot of it. No, no. Well, yeah. that's the thing is that I think 
um, if you're judicious, it's much prettier than when it's overdone. Yeah. So. So so when you, so you you're picking away at this while you're raising kids, and then do you start designing? Yes. How, when does the design part start? Well, the design started because I was made program chairman for one of the guilds I belong to. And Uh-oh. it was, yeah, I know, I know. It's all their fault and all their blessing, you know, because uh, I, I would have probably um, not ever taught. I, you know, I wouldn't have been in my wheelhouse. And I'd, uh, I'd taken the job and realized that we had a really low budget. And so uh, with another friend, she and I designed a couple of pieces. Uh, and, I, you know, I think you should keep all your early work. It reminds you how far you've come. <laughs> it's, it's hanging in the entryway still with all the other things. And it's like, okay, it's all right. But at that time, I was doing a lot of counted thread because I do like counted thread. I was doing linen and you know, some of the sampler stitches, a lot of things like that. And this is back in the early 80s. And uh, I uh, decided that with her that we would do a, a three-month program. And we made, we wrote the directions. We designed it. I taught it. She had, she had Mike Fright. And so I did the teaching. And, and it was, it was a big group. There were probably 150 women in the group at the time. And we met on Mon- uh, one Monday night. And, you know, by the time I had taken that job, I felt like they were all my friends. So it made teaching so much easier. It wasn't terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. And they, and they were so generous. They, and they, they were so uh, grateful. And so I did a lot of drawn thread, withdrawn thread, cross stitch, all of those sorts of things for years with that group. And that was an EGA group. And then I got involved in an A and G group and, I had been designing my own things for a long time, but uh, I didn't think they were, I never considered anybody would be interested, kind of not ready for prime time sort of thing. And um, I, uh, so that my bigger pieces that I designed were all at home, but I would do Christmas ornaments and Halloween and things for the guild and would teach it at the guild. And it was, it was wonderful. We had a, a great time and they were so encouraging and, and, and let's face it, most most of the folks that belong to those kinds of organizations are really receptive to to newer people to come in. They, they're yes. kind. You know, after you're there a while, they'll tell you what they think. But <laughs> at first, they tell you all the nice things. So um, I, uh, I think I didn't start teaching in a shop probably till the 90s. And I did an ornament a month. Uh, Christmas ornament a month for about seven years. Ooh, that's a, I, that's a stiff schedule. Holy smokes! It is a stiff schedule. <laughs> I would I would pile them up, but I would but I had really wonderful students that came there, and they didn't take you know some of them could take all of them, and some of them could only come a couple of times a year. But and and in between that, I did canvas enhancements and other things in the shop. So that was my first leap and then i think i sent you a picture of the plum blossom kimono yes uh yeah and that that piece um was one was probably my third or fourth big piece that i ever taught and i when i designed that i designed it to teach for a group and i i never really thought it would go anywhere and it it took me a lot of places. It's, it's, it was a, it was a very nice, um, uh, and a very good piece to. It was a travel log actually. By the time it was all done, yeah. we, I did. Yeah, I still teach it, but not very often. I mean, it's it's from 1999, I think. So, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it still gets calls. You never know. Where, what what is the the fork in the road? I, I always fascinates me in needlepoint because you tend to have. I don't know, 40% are painted canvas and 40% are charted. And then there's that 20% that will bounce back and forth. What, right. What, what is it that makes you go charted? Mm, well, I mean, is I'm there, to, is, it, is it something that you just, just evolved into? Well, okay. I, it, I did evolve into it. It kind of started because of the Christmas ornaments. I, you know, I don't, um, I'm a little um, obsessive compulsive about some things and sometimes painted canvas isn't painted the way I like it, you know? And so, so I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just make up some of these little ornaments and see how they go. And it came, it came down to that 
um, I found that if people could take a class, and, and I'm talking about even in the shops where I've taught, they, they would buy a painted canvas and they would work on it and, and finish it. They did some, I have some wonderful students and they do some beautiful work. And they, uh, we would have fun picking the threads and we'd have fun picking the stitches. And, and, um, and then, then it was like uh, coloring, like paint by number. And, and that really meets some people's needs. And other people, even though you give them a stitch, they're going to change it. And, you know, I get that. I understand it. And uh, with me, I wanted to do things that were just a little bit different. And geometry is one of my loves. So um, there's all kinds of wild and fascinating kinds. And people think, oh, what is she talking about? But <laughs> I, there's a lot of really interesting techniques that, that lend themselves to, uh, and designs that lend themselves to a county canvas. And that's basically how it came about. Uh, that like, for instance, the, uh, I have a whole series of kimonos that I've done. And the reason those kimonos were designed were uh, just to showcase stitches. Yeah. You know, to teach people stitches. They're actually stitch samplers. And, and so I, t I like to teach the technique that goes with it. But they can use that technique, whether it's a painted canvas or a charted canvas. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So, but I like it. Uh, there are some people that are just more comfortable with painting canvas and, um, and then others that, um, uh, frankly, um, charted canvas is less expensive, so it fits their budgets better. So, yeah, no, I, I know that that's a factor for some people and, and yeah, some of yes. those, some of those painted canvases will make you flinch until you learn what goes into making them. And then you, you understand. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But and art. yeah, that, that's so, you know. But if you set the money aside, you know, I think there's an interesting psychology between the two. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Now, see, How I, do you I, see it? I, well, I end up uh, charted. You know, I, uh -huh. I I enjoy the charted. It's uh, but see, for me, it's the blank. It's the blank slate that you start with. Mm -hmm. and you watch it evolve before your very eyes and but but i just i just enjoy making the stitches and and i, I you know to me it's that's the fun part and i and i appreciate that with painted canvas you get to do the same thing but uh uh in my my mind just loves the the symmetry and you know, everything's even and everything's in order and all of that that's it uh, yeah. that's it it's it's a control issue yeah, you know, it, is. It, it is, it is. No, I, I admit it fully and completely. And my husband would be shaking his, nodding his head. Yes. If he were standing here, because it gives me, I'm, I'm the boss of the thread. I'm the boss of the canvas. I do what I want. And I'm, it's always interesting, Gary, because I'll be uh, teaching a class and somebody will say, well, why didn't you do it this way? And sometimes I have a reason and sometimes I don't. And sometimes I say, oh, I wish I had. You know, I mean, you know, yeah. sometimes it's nice to have fresh looks at what you're doing. But the ladies and gentlemen, I find that, and this is interesting, I find that most of the gentlemen students that I have had prefer counted work. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, some of them will do painted. The, uh, most of them will do both. But some of them will only do counted work. And it's, um, I always say the joys in the journey. And I think that that's part of it is that. It's there, there, like you say, it's blank and it starts to grow. And the more it grows, the happier you are. And you're, you look at it and you can, it's easy to see what you've done. And that's how I feel when I'm designing. Uh, on, and I, as I said, I do everything I do is counted. So, yeah, 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 yeah it's, it's, yeah, I, I, I just enjoy that more. And I have, I have two painted canvases that uh that are in my uh, pile of stuff that i keep threatening to do and, and every now and then i'll take them out and look at them and say all right how would i do this but mm -hmm. i you know i have to admit then after a little while i just put it away and haul out a <laughs> pull, pull out a charted piece and work on it um yeah yeah it's it just i don't know i just enjoy that more and those kimonos that the kimono is interesting to me uh okay. because yeah because it is you know, it's an interesting shape, number one. 
Right. And then, and then, it, yeah, they really end up being samplers. Are those easy to design uh, because it's always the same shape? Well, or? no, because no two of mine are ever the same. Oh, okay. I changed them. They're all changed. I have a whole series of small ones. And um, uh, some time back, they were in one of the magazines and for a year, a year of them. And the editor wrote at the beginning, and all you have to do, you can just stitch the outlines and then fill it all in. And I had to write her a note and say, none of the outlines are the same. And <laughs> the, reason, the reason was, is that when I designed those, uh, they, were, they were meant to be grab a new stitcher and bring them in kind of pieces. Oh, they were okay. a little bit different. Uh, there's In the small ones, there's maybe anywhere from four to seven different stitches in it, not too many, uh, some metallic, and everything, every compensation is charted for them. Mm -hmm. So what, what the size of the kimono was determined by the particular stitch that I used, so that if I could stitch an area without having to compensate, then a new stitcher can do this and feel really good. And about being able to make it fit, the problem, the only problem is you have to count and you have to count correctly. Um, I had, uh, I was teaching the Plum Blossom, which is the, the, that was my very first kimono that I did. And I was teaching it to a large group um, up in Northern California. And um, they were a, a, a group much like Fox chapter, uh, real, um, interested and interesting stitchers, very um, inquisitive and adventurous. And so it was a really fun two days with this group. And there was one lady that came up to me and she said, I made a mistake and I'm just uh, with this one area and I'm just going to, I'm just going to fake it. And I said, well, okay, well, that's not really going to work very well, but we'll try. Tell me which block it is and I'll chart an alternate pattern for you and she says no no I'll make it stand I'll make it work and it was right smack dab in the middle and I said okay you know I don't want to discourage her she can do as she pleases so I said but if you get into trouble let me know and about six months later I get an email and she said this is the size <laughs> you know <laughs> can you chart it and and I'm willing to do that because I want them to be successful yeah. and and she she was a fairly new stitcher and she just didn't think that two threads would make a big difference and um it Oops. did yeah <laughs> well i always say if you're not ripping you're not learning uh, but new stitchers really don't want to hear that yeah they want they just want to stitch so yeah yeah that's uh, that for me anything i start i always make sure i have plenty of thread i don't want to ever exactly. you know. <laughs> yeah because yeah because because just that and 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 i if i rip it out i won't reuse it no no i yeah. never do either no throw it no. away and, and Yep. Yeah, it's it's trash then, and and start fresh. Yeah, so. yeah. So I yeah, I, I always make sure I have ample, and that's why I, I flinch at kits. Is, oh yes. Is I always yes. feel like I'm against the wall. I have to be careful with every half inch of thread for fear I'll run out, and it uh, it makes me nervous. So I just stay away from kits. But uh, but but good good people. Now you take Gay Ann Rogers when she does a kit. She makes darn sure you have plenty of thread for everything. Oh, yes, she does. Yeah. yeah. She is good. She is very good at yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, I design as I go, uh, you know, so I, ha I start out with full hanks and full skeins and full cards of everything. So I know exactly what I started with. And if I have to add to it, I have a record of that. And then, and I rip a lot when I'm designing. I do. And so all of that is, I, it stays in the count. I don't, I don't deduct what I ripped it, ripped because oh, okay. if I ripped, they're going to rip, you know, <laughs> really, you know, even if I'd ripped it because I decided I wanted a different pattern, it's still going to happen. If people make mistakes or, uh, I was teaching a class, uh, to a big group and the background color on this particular piece was kind of a forest green. This was probably about 15 years ago. And the floor on the, in the room, it was in a hotel, um, ballroom and the floor was dark green and more people lost their thread <laughs> you know? and so I was going around picking thread up off the floor and saying is this yours is this yours you know and I thought and so at the end of the class I asked them all to give me their names and so I could 
figure out how many it was because I told the workshop chairman, everybody's going to need more green because they've <laughs> lost it in here today. And we <laughs> sent it to them because you can't, you know, you die lots change. You have to right. do it. Right. Yeah. So it makes a difference. Oh yeah. No, I, um, uh, working on a Debbie Raleigh piece right now, her glitz and glamour opal and, yes. and had to get some uh, dinky dyes thread that didn't exist anymore. And oh. when I got it, uh, and, and it, this, this one had been given to me, someone had kitted it up and never wanted to do it and had given mm -hmm. it to me. And, uh, I, I was clearly not going to have enough and boy, the, uh, the, the additional thread I got, Holy smokes. I mean, it's the dye lot, not even, not even in the it, ball game. It doesn't even look like the same right. thread. Right. I, I have, um, more than once been stung as a designer by, uh, companies that have gone out of business or dyers who quit dying and i there are several pieces that i've one i just restitched uh recently because people want to stitch it and at the time the person who uh, uh i bought the thread from made a kit and so they could just call her and order the kit mm -hmm. and or or go online and order it and then she closed her business so the not not only did we not have the thread, but that pattern was dead as far as I was concerned. You know, right. I couldn't teach it because, and it was a lot of different colors in it. And so pe enough people came to me and said, we really want to do this. So I worked up another colorway and, um, but it's, it's hard because it's hard to go back and do, uh, do an old design or um, a, a previous design, because as you're going, you want to change it. Right. You know, because that's just the way I am. I just think, oh, this this would be better. I should do this, and they don't want that. They want exactly what they saw. Yeah. So it's it it was a uh, frustrating for me, but I'm glad I did it. So <laughs> they'll be happy with it. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. That's a hard that's a hard wall to break through. To go from this is what I saw, so I bought the chart, and that's what I want. To wait a minute, I could do it this way, and I might enjoy it more. That's that's, I mean, I know it's a hard wall for me sometimes to break through. I'm getting sure. much better at it. And because, it, yeah, it's okay to go red here where it was, you know, blue. <laughs> you sure, know? sure. But people, people do have a lot of angst over color choices and they want to change colors and they're not really sure how. Uh, and I do a lot of this with the girls that, uh, and the local girls that come to my weekly classes. Some of them are all canvas and that's all they do painted canvas and we we have fun we uh -huh. have a lot of fun and then others are doing some of my designs and they want to change the colors and it's really uh, a challenge and i i always go through it okay all right there's this many values in that shade and this many values in that shade so let's look for two colors you like and pick you know, one that's got the, you know, and it's, uh, there's a little more science to it than they think, at least my stuff. I kind of, I'm, I kind of have a little, uh, formula when I, on each piece I work on because mm -hmm. I know people want to change colors and, and some, some teacher designers are, it makes, well, it hurts their feelings. Um, and it doesn't hurt mine because, uh, you know, I don't like colors. Everybody else. You know, I don't like everybody's colors either, so I like to pick my own if I can. Yeah. And it's if I if I if there's a a sensible formula to the way I designed it, then it's easy for them and easy for me to help them pull them. And a lot of my designs have multiple colorways listed in the charts for that mm -hmm. very reason. Yeah. Is that is that how you uh, go about if someone wants to change colors? Let's get out what I designed, so we can see what values I that you used, and then branch off from there? Or how, how do you recommend people start that process? Well, if they're working on my designs, yes. Uh, because I, I then once I know what colors they like, then it's easy for us to go over and pull colors and different fibers for them to stitch with, mm -hmm. you know, and doesn't have to be. And I, I am, I really like laying silk and, and I even like laying floss. I, uh, I, I like neon rays. People shudder, but I love neon <laughs> rays because I like the way it looks. And I, to me, it's worth the trouble. It, I, I, I feel like I can, I can do a good job with it, but I've had a lot of practice, 
but I know people hate me. Some people hate it, and but they'll yeah, love you can, me on you can em- Plus. You can empty a good portion of a room with with neon rays, yes, and, and flare. <laughs> oh yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and flare. Yet the colors are amazing, and then, and sometimes those are just the thread you want. And if they learn that they can put up with it for, you know, a couple of square inches, then they'll do it. Yeah. But uh, but if it has too much of it, you know, I'm I'm out there picking different threads for them. So I'm pretty conscious of what people don't like, and I try not to give it to them. And um, I I because there's I just like to try all the new stuff. Right. Well, and 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 a lot of that Rainbow Gallery stuff the colors but but the textures that they add are, yes. are so different that um it, it really even in small doses it really adds some nice dimension that, that you just can't get any other way well the texture you know i think uh when i look at uh work that other people's work that i like um i do like i said i do a lot of laid silk and laid floss and but not everything i do is like that and but i look at other people's like Terry Dryden. I don't know if you know her stuff, but no. she uses lots of color and lots of texture, and it's really fun. And I, you know, I like to stitch her work. I and I and her colors are pretty vibrant. And sometimes people will say, "Well, can we change these colors?" And she just says no, you know. And because she worked hard to make it look that way, and mm-hmm. and and a lot of her stuff, I can't imagine trying to change the colors in it. But it's so. <laughs> it's so fun to stitch because she's got different threads and different colors and it's a lot of fun a lot of fun yeah i don't know terry but i'm gonna learn her uh, yeah i think you will I i'll think be you'll looking like that it. up yeah 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 call me i'll give you a number okay all right <laughs> yeah. i'll do that <laughs> yeah yeah you'll yeah. like her stuff what but, what are you seeing in in all of the teaching that you do so so you travel and teach as you did for the fox chapter but then it, yeah. you, you mentioned that you also have your own weekly uh, teaching there near at, at home. Sure. Yes. I teach in a, a local shop, Needlepoints Limited, on Tuesdays. I have a Tuesday morning and a Tuesday night class. And then I teach in a couple of other uh, places, like a community room that's available uh, for classes and uh, on Wednesdays and then one Saturday a month. Uh, you know, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the ladies are retired, but if we want to get the work people that are still working and young involved, we have to have an evening class and we have to have some weekend stuff. Uh, they don't have us; they can't do an every weekend class because they've got other responsibilities too. But if you, if they can get away for an all day Saturday class, uh, I have a we have a better chance of bringing those stitchers into the fold. Um, and that's the, one of the problems is that, you know, we're not, we're not getting as many new stitchers, but I, um, I teach on, uh, an open, it's an open class is what I do on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And so the girls don't have to come every week and, and the gentlemen, cause I have some gentlemen that are coming too, but they don't have to come every week. They come when they need help. And some do come all the time. Uh, it's a, um, really nice little community and, they, um, I help them with their work and, and some of them, I nudge them along into stitches that they don't think they can do, but they can. And to, to try threads that they thought would be terrible and they love them. And, you know, <laughs> it's, it's really fun. It's really fun. Yeah. 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 I was having a, having a conversation with our chapter president the other day about that very topic of being accessible to the younger people particularly young mothers who yes. who are, are are very limited in, in what they can do but given a chance will jump at it in terms of it, can i get out for a saturday morning and leave the kids exactly. with my husband and just just to get out and do this kind of thing and we were talking about that that very thing How, what what do you do as a chapter or in your case as a teacher or as a shop that opens the door for those people and at least gives them even if it's a small dose once a month, at least gives them something where they can get out and and get some knowledge and have some fun, have some adult time, and then uh, go back and be able to stitch if if the kid's still taking a nap, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Need need more of that, I think, yes. 
Well, we, I was just discussing this with the girl that owns the shop where I teach, uh, how hard it is uh, to get new stitchers in and how, and to introduce them to it. They're, they're used to going to the craft stores and buying a kit and, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But when they go into a needlepoint shop and they see a painted canvas and it's an ornament and it's $45, they're horrified. Yeah. And so it's our job as a teacher or a shop owner to educate them on why that canvas is worth $45 and or 35 even, you know, because they're, they're used to, you know, buying uh, an inexpensive kit. I understand that. I, we all started, listen, I, um, I grew up in Texas, but I lived in North Carolina for a while and I didn't have, I didn't have any f- friends. I didn't know anybody when I got there. And the only needlework I could get was like out of uh, good housekeeping. I could order kits. And uh-huh. so, you know, I did all of them and I'd work them up and then I'm, then, you know, I'd be ready for the next one and ready for the next one. And so, um, but I didn't have a community and we, uh, our young people don't even realize this community is out there. Um, they hear about it uh, from their friends mothers you know they go oh it's just old ladies you know i'm not gonna go it's just old ladies and and uh, i've had some really wonderful young women um uh come and and they're they're inventive and they're artistic and they don't even know it you know they you they say well i i don't really know what i want and so you start talking to them well do you like this or this well they have definite opinions and i say you know more than you think you know uh-huh. and you know what you like and to me that's the biggest part if they know what they like they know the colors they like we can go from there yeah. we can do anything and they're really fun but it is a struggle and all the guilds all over the country when I go around and teach, I hear it and I teach in some shops around the country and um, there we've tried all kinds of ways to bring younger women into some of the chapters. And um, I think the best thing we can do is to make them feel welcome and and not to forget that they're beginners, because, as you know, when you're in a chapter a long time, as I have been, uh, a lot of the um veterans we won't say older <laughs> a lot of the veteran stitchers have done it all yeah and they're like i don't want to do that i've already done it well if we can make it interesting enough for them to do it again and then the young people can learn something that's really much easier so i i like to uh when i'm designing pieces to teach for a guild i like to make them the kind of piece that um they have some choices in stitches. They have some choices in colors. Uh, I take a stitch that they've done before and work it another way. So the older, uh, long, longer member that's been around a longer time that has, has something a little different to do. And the newer member is learning something she doesn't even know is different or he. And I think that if we can, uh, if we can in, intrigue them, if we can make them interested in figuring out what they can do next and i do the same thing with painted canvas you know why do you think you have to do that there you know you could do this and you know and i think it uh i think we need to question things more being more inquisitive and i think if we can teach that uh i have a student that's 92 believe it or not she is still driving and stitching up a storm and she's doing a great job that's fantastic I, i love it i love it i actually have two of them and um, and they are they are the most um, encouraging. Uh, they love the new new when the new people come to class. They right there. They're talking to them and asking them, you know, where they live and how they get into stitching. And and I think to myself, you know, this is this is what we need. We need to, you know, it's the old work hard, move up, reach down. And mm-hmm. bring somebody up with you, and it's we do we should do the same thing in stitching. We should enjoy our stitching, but don't forget to sprinkle it all over the place. Yeah. And and and, uh, and, and, and it and requires people. It requires a conscious effort to to do it. Yes, it does. Uh, yeah, you have to you have to say, all right, we're going to make sure this happens, and we're going to figure out how to do it. And uh, because it, that's you know, I look at in the cross stitch world uh, the floss tube. 
Um, yes. You know, that, that has become a massive, very active community that uh, uh, primarily cross-stitch and, and for the most part, younger people. And I look at that as almost the equivalent today of what we had back in the 80s with uh, cross-stitch shops. Where exactly. It, it, I mean, it's, I think it's grown the activity and the designs and the sharing through floss tube and through all those retreats have grown that cross stitch market, that cross stitch aspect of the hobby, back to what it once was, just in a different form. And, I agree. Yeah, uh, it's exciting. I think it's very exciting. And and so a lot of us, as you were saying, you you know, you did needlepoint, but you went to cross stitch because it fit what you were doing at the time. Right. And right. I did a lot of counted thread and some cross stitch because you know it's and and I, I always hear people say, but it. It's just cross stitch. And I said, you know, that it's not just cross stitch. It's <laughs> cross stitch. And there are people that do amazingly beautiful things with just floss and a needle and yep. a piece of linen. And and I adore it. I have uh, many friends who uh, they they always have uh, a canvas piece going and a cross stitch piece going and a bag of knitting. <laughs> They're ready for anything. They're ready for anything, you know? And I think sometimes that's what we should do. We should be more prepared. We, You know, we always say that we'll make a kid out of this and we'll get to it someday. And, you know, probably, Gary, honestly, if I didn't leave the house for the next five years, I wouldn't, maybe 10 or 20 even, I wouldn't <laughs> run out of things to do, right? Yep. Do you feel the same way? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think most people that you meet in the guilds and in the shops, you know, we all have it stacked up. But we, I, I, and, and people say, I'm saving this for, re, for retirement. Don't save it. Nope. Do it. Cause you're going to want to do something else when you retire. Yeah. There, there's going to be a new canvas you want or a new design you want to stitch. And you may not want to go back and do that one anymore. Do it. Enjoy it. Enjoy the process. Don't yeah. wait. Isn't that true? Yeah. Give me food, water and TV, internet. And yeah, I could. Yeah. Yeah, for and some years. good music, and I can do it. I can do it. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yep. I could be a hermit. Never spend not. another dime, and I could still That's keep right. going. I could yep. still do it. Yeah, I might have to buy some thread, just simply because it feeds your soul. Right. Right. Yeah, you have to do that. You have to do that. We have to keep those people in business. So. Yes, we do. Yes. What, when when you have your classes, what are what are some of the biggest hurdles for stitchers? What what keeps coming up as a as a, a hurdle or a challenge? You mean like in a class I would go and teach a set cl- a set yeah. piece for a guild? Well, sometimes um, they're fearful uh, that they they can't do it. It looks too hard to them, especially about when the whole thing is counted. Mm-hmm. Uh, they it's a little terrifying, and I. I found recently I don't like to do draw- drawings for the canvas. I prefer people count everything because what right. if I count it wrong and draw the line? So, you know, then I'm in trouble. And uh, so I, I really uh, I see with them that even if I've just and I, this is a recent piece I taught, uh, I drew the square that was for the center. I just counted it out and drew the square so that they could work all they could work in the lower left corner then move to the lower right corner then move to the upper right and to the upper left and just go around they were so much more relaxed oh they 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 needed that parameter they needed that right there that that helped them get going whereas when um i give them pre-work for a lot of pieces and you have a, a kind of a canvas sampler that i sent you the picture of a green and and uh, lavender and purple, I have them stitched that ahead of time. And that makes them very nervous. And so I have written instructions on how to do it. And when they get there and it's done, they're so happy. And then they just get to stitch. So I feel like if I can prepare them even before I come to class, uh, then that's going to make it easier. I think that they believe they can't do it. So they believe it's hard. And I always say it's really just paint by number. You know, I number the stitches so you know how to do them. Mm-hmm. I talk about why I work them that way. And so then they understand why they're numbered that way. Um, we so often, um, 
we don't mean to be, but we can be dogmatic about how things should be done. And there's more than one way to skin a cat and there's more than one way to work a stitch. And so I always just say that, uh, you know, you, you may work it differently than me, but that doesn't mean it won't be pretty. I took a class back in the eighties from a, a lady, uh, that I just loved. Uh, her name was Eleanor Bockheim and she was a counted thread person. And I was taking this uh, class from her and it was a pulled thread class. And I was having the best time and I I'm sitting there and I've not done a lot of pull thread on, on linen. It was on linen and I have not done a lot of it. I've done some, but not a lot. And so she came, we were, she was having us work on a particular stitch. And so she came over and she goes, that's beautiful. And I said, thank you. It's your stitch. She goes, no, it's not. <laughs> that's not, <laughs> that's not the way it's charted. I don't know what you did, but that's <laughs> not it. And when she said that to me, I want to just rip it out. And she said, no, no, just do it again. And yeah. if you can, if you can chart it, give it to me. And, you know, I think that, that something like that can give you wings. Yeah. And there have been teachers all along the way that I could name that, that just in a class, maybe not spoken to me, but spoken to other people that were very encouraging, that makes you believe that you can do it. Uh, when I taught for Fox, um, some of them kind of had a deer in the headlights look the first day because we were jumping in with both feet. They mm -hmm. had, they had a line drawn canvas that they had to do a little bit of basting, but by noon they were all working like little, you know, just little <laughs> workmen out there just stitching away and they seemed to be having a really good time. So sometimes we can ease it and, and we may, sometimes we make it too hard and it shouldn't be hard. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, that's very true. Ivan, Ivana Pfeiffer and I were talking this past Wednesday about uh, is is a beginner piece really even necessary, uh, particularly these days? It, do we really care if it's a beginner piece, if, even if you've never done it? Because instructions are so good, diagrams right. are so good that you you can really, for the most part, at least the two of us talked ourselves into it, uh, dive into something that people would consider intermediate or advanced. And, I agree. you know, if you just take your time, you can do it. There's no reason you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to do a beginner thing to graduate. Well, I think, I think we lose people by giving them beginner pieces. Yeah. I yeah. think, I think they get bored with them. They, they're looking around at what everybody else is doing and it may be not in a big class, but in like a shop or, or the guild, you go to stitch and chat or, or whatever social, uh, time that your particular guild has and you look around the room uh, I designed a piece that uh, was a was really uh, supposed to be a stash piece everybody's supposed to bring all of their you know a bunch of thread pick their two favorite colors and and bring their favorite uh, threads and just do it that would be fun it would be a lot of fun we could all do it well I noticed that by noon on the first day it was a two-day class they were all looking at each other's colors yeah like, like I want, oh, I wish I'd have done that. Oh, oh. I wish I'd done that. <laughs> so the next time I came to teach that same group, I brought them a, a, a pattern that I made from the original. I pulled out the center and put borders around it and said, because we taught it a, like a month apart, one day a month apart, but a two-day class. So they mm -hmm. had time in between. Mm -hmm. So I came with this. And at the end of the day, I said, okay, you've been lusting after your friend's colors. Now here's a pattern. Go find them. <laughs> and it was really fun and they finished them they finished them it was really fun so you know they it, it, i said maybe your friends have thread left over you can use theirs whatever but <laughs> the shop owners love it because they sell a lot of threads no kidding yeah exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah yeah come do yeah, another have, one of those yeah, yeah we, well we have to keep them in business or we have nowhere to go right you right. know i love our shops so well and that's, at some point it's just fun to buy thread anyway so Oh yeah. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what, that's how this piece got designed actually, because when you buy thread, when you see a new thread, do you buy your favorite colors? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. yeah so sure. you have drawer, you have drawers full of whatever it might be. Mine. I like the purples and I like the greens and I like the pinks. And so, but I can't use them Gary, because then if I do, I don't have them anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. You're right. Yeah, Cause they're precious, you know, so, I designed this piece to use your favorite colors, and that was the plan. And so they showed up, and it was really interesting. 
you know, people did have favorite colors and they brought them. So it was fun. Yeah. That's interesting that if you give them that, that the, the fear of starting there, that if you give them a ref, basically a reference point that they relax and, and, and dig in. Mm -hmm. They get into it. Yeah. And permission, permission. That's why that's where, if you're not ripping, you're not learning came from was those kinds of pieces, because I would tell them, you go ahead and stitch that block and don't, if you're, if you're not sure you like it, leave it and move on to the next one. And then if it still bothers you tomorrow, then we'll take it out. But you have to be willing to rip or you're not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, do a couple of blocks around it and see what you think. And they were fun. They were, and they were, and they were also game. They, they were up for it. So, (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's part of, that's part of the, you know, that, that adventure. There's, yes. there's, there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. Just yeah. 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 jump into the big unknown. Yeah. Well, and that, that that's for me, you know, people ask, well, what are you going to do with that piece or that piece? And, and my standard answer is whatever my wife wants. Cause I really don't care. <laughs> you know, I always say whatever I want. So yeah. that's yeah. interesting. No, I, I mean, yeah. I just, I finish it. When I finish one, I really just don't care. It was, it was the the fun of doing it, right? And, and then it's over for me. If you want to frame it or make a pillow, I I don't care. Um, or it goes in the drawer. Right. I'm yeah. happy. Yeah. Me yeah. too. Yeah, I yeah, got my I, money's money's worth out of it. I don't care. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the joys in the journey. And yeah. we, I think that those of us who just love stitching and playing with threads and color, uh, you know, that's what it's all about. And like I said, when I was doing this at home alone, I had no idea anybody else would be interested. But you know, they did. They were, <laughs> and and luckily, still are. Yeah. So yeah. So, so uh, speaking of home, what uh, people are always curious about what designers have. You have a studio. You have just a, a corner in a room. What's your working space like? Okay, I have. I'm sitting in it right this minute, and I'm glad we don't have a camera because it's <laughs> it's a it's a fright. Uh, but I have I have uh, a, a whole room, and I always say everything has to stay in the room because if once it gets out, it'll take over the house. So it's probably like a ten by thirteen bedroom that I converted, and I everything is in here. My I've got file cabinets full of patterns and file cabinets full of ideas, and I've got um, little cabinets with tons of threads and. Um, I have a whole wall of books that I just look at and get ideas and inspirations from. Um, but it's, it is my little cave sort of, uh, uh-huh. and I, you know, I've got my canvas, my blank canvas rolled up, standing in the corner, ready to pull out and put on bars and do something with. So it's, um, it's, it's pretty wonderful. It's, it's loaded with, all kinds of threads and my computers in here and my big copier uh, that I print all my, all my patterns with. And uh-huh. so it's jam packed. It sometimes there's just a path through it, but today you could actually, <laughs> you could actually dance in here. If you had to today, it would be a little dance, a cha-cha, <laughs> but not, <laughs> not, not a waltz, but you could, you can move around in it today. After I finish a big piece, I always come in and kind of clean things up. Yeah. Put the, put the threads away and start to write the instructions. And so that's where I am now writing instructions on a piece. So, so it, yeah. Okay. So you can just walk in that room and just be in your own little world then. It is. Yeah. I go to work. I get up and I go to work in here. I come in every morning and, uh, and if I'm really working, I, and I can't, I, 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 I need to focus. I don't turn the computer on. I just, stitch i put on some music sometimes television in the background uh and and i'm in my own little world and the world goes past like our kids are grown and gone with their own little families and it's my husband and i and he's he's always reading and and has his things to do too where we uh we give each other plenty of space to do what it is we do he, he plays guitar and writes songs and i make um I make designs on canvas and linen and I enjoy it. So 
A lot to be said for ne- empty nesting, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I thought it was going to be horrible, but you know. No, no it's not. <laughs> no, it's been very nice, I must say. Yeah. I, miss, yeah. I miss the kids, but no, it's yeah. not. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's wonderful to see them. Yep. And I love when they're here or when we were up visiting them because our both of our kids live in the Bay Area with their families. And it's wonderful when we're all together. Uh, and it's wonderful to see their little families. And um, But we come back home and we sit down to dinner and look at each other and smile and say, this is just fine. Yep. This is okay. <laughs> we can do, we can do this. Yeah. So, yeah. So true. Nice. I yep. know. So, so true. Nice. Yeah. I must have a poltergeist. My copier just turned itself on. Uh-oh. I haven't even been near it. Yeah. Uh-oh. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> All right, Margaret, this has been fun. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gary. And I, like I said, I appreciate you inviting me to be on your show. Yep. I nice little podcast so yep. well enjoyed fun, fun. enjoyed the conversation learned a lot it's good oh good so, good yep. i'm glad i'm glad all right thanks all to right. everybody thanks to everybody for listening and let's see this wednesday will be uh debbie rowley and me debbie rowley is going to be uh joining me for the wednesday show so um look forward okay. to that and uh what is it uh a and angfox.org i'll put the link on the page but angfox.org <laughs> slideshow of margaret's uh, uh ornaments and i'm putting i'm really this is mean i'm doing this to poor mary but uh <laughs> i think if you fill i think if you filled out a form and sent a check to mary mcguire uh, all the instructions are there i think mary'd make sure that uh, you got in on the order to margaret for her ornaments so um, you're so kind let's so uh, is mary yeah let's let's overwhelm it, it, well what'll happen is I'll get a call from Mary. Okay, you did this to me, and I'll get over here and help me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it's going to be. She's great. She might make me fly to Chicago, so watch yeah. it. Okay. All right, well, that's okay. All right, so that's the challenge then. All right, let's, okay. buy, let's buy a bunch of Margaret Bendig ornaments, overwhelm Mary McGuire so that she calls me and screams. Okay, that's oh, the deal. That, that's it. Okay, all right. All right, thanks for listening, everybody.